During the Age of Discovery, a transformative period of large-scale colonization unfolded across the Americas, led by several powerful European nations. This era, which spanned from the late 15th century to the early 19th century, saw Spain, Portugal, Britain, France, Russia, the Netherlands, Denmark, and Sweden embark on extensive exploration, seeking to claim territories, natural resources, and human labor across the New World. The consequences for the indigenous peoples were profound and often devastating. European actions led to widespread displacement, disestablishment of indigenous communities, forced enslavement, and in many tragic cases, outright genocide. These incursions also laid the groundwork for new settler colonial states, which profoundly shaped the Americas. Even into the 21st century, some of these settler regions remain relatively rural and sparsely populated by indigenous communities, including areas like New Mexico, Alaska, and the Northern Great Plains in North America, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec and the Yucatan Peninsula in Central America, and regions such as the Northwest Amazon and Araucania in South America. Europe's surge in wealth and influence during this period was unexpected in the early 1400s. At that time, European nations were preoccupied with internal conflicts and were still recovering from the massive population loss inflicted by the Black Death. However, new challenges and opportunities arose when the Ottoman Empire came to dominate the trade routes to Asia, pushing Western European monarchs to seek alternative paths to the East. This urgency gave rise to the famous voyages of Christopher Columbus, whose fateful arrival in the Americas unveiled a new world, full of prospects for European expansion. The Treaty of Tordesillas in 1494 set the stage for a dramatic reordering of the world as known to Europeans. In a monumental agreement, Portugal and Spain divided the globe between them, designating non-Christian lands in the eastern half to Portugal and those in the western half to Spain. Under this treaty, Spain laid claim to nearly all of the Americas, while Portugal retained dominion over the eastern tip of South America, a boundary that would eventually shape modern Brazil. By the 1530s, other European powers, most notably Britain and France, had recognized the lucrative potential of ventures to the Americas. They launched colonial endeavors of their own, particularly targeting the northeastern regions that make up today's United States. Over the following century, these efforts expanded as Swedish settlers established New Sweden, the Dutch claimed New Netherland, and Denmark-Norway, together with Swedish and Dutch settlers, set up colonies in the Caribbean. By the 18th century, Denmark-Norway had revived its colonial interests in Greenland, while Russia began asserting its presence along the Pacific coast, claiming lands from Alaska all the way down to California. Accounts from both indigenous and European sources paint a picture of pre-Columbian American civilizations as highly advanced, with achievements that spanned impressive urban planning, complex governance, and scientific ingenuity. Among these societies, the Aztecs were a prime example, constructing Tenochtitlan, a city that would later become the foundation of modern Mexico City. At its peak, Tenochtitlan was among the world's largest cities, with approximately 200,000 residents in the city itself and around 5 million people under its broader empire. For comparison, only Constantinople and Paris in 16th century Europe could rival such size, boasting populations of 300,000 and 200,000 respectively. Other major cities like London, Madrid, and Rome each had populations closer to just 50,000. At that same time in 1523, England's entire population was under 3 million. These numbers underscore the Aztecs' sophisticated urban development, agricultural mastery, and structured governance, all of which were necessary to manage such a large society effectively. Further testaments to the achievements of indigenous civilizations are found in their advances in astronomy and mathematics. Many of these societies produced highly accurate calendars rivaling and even surpassing those in use elsewhere in the world at the time. The domestication of maize, or corn, was another remarkable accomplishment, achieved through thousands of years of selective breeding. This careful cultivation continued across generations, with women often leading the effort, maintaining a diversity of maize varieties that was essential to the diet and culture of these societies. These developments highlight the thoughtful, organized approaches to both scientific and agricultural practices that flourished long before European contact. Estimating the population of the Americas before Columbus's arrival is a challenging task due to the fragmentary evidence available. Scholarly estimates vary widely, with figures spanning from as low as 8 million to as high as 112 million. This considerable range reflects the difficulties researchers face in gathering consistent data, with most estimates built upon extrapolations from limited and often localized information, 
In 1976, geographer William Denovan attempted to find a middle ground by synthesizing existing figures, producing a consensus count of around 54 million people. Denovan later refined this estimate in 1992, suggesting that approximately 53.9 million people lived in the Americas before European contact. His regional breakdown estimated about 3.8 million in what is now the United States and Canada, 17.2 million in Mexico, 5.6 million in Central America, 3 million in the Caribbean, 15.7 million in the Andes, and 8.6 million across the lowland areas of South America. Despite these efforts, population estimates for the period remain highly variable, with recent studies providing new figures that further challenge consensus. One particularly surprising finding came from a 2020 genetic study which proposed that previous estimates of the Caribbean's pre-Columbian population could be exaggerated by a factor of 10. Historian David Stannard offered a stark perspective, suggesting that the deaths related to European colonization could amount to 100 million indigenous lives lost. A 2019 study provided additional insight by linking a decrease in atmospheric CO2 around the 1600s to a drastic drop in population. Estimating that pre-Columbian figures were over 60 million, reduced to just 6 million by the turn of the century. However, some researchers contest these conclusions, questioning the methodology and assumptions used to reach them. The arrival of Europeans brought profound and often catastrophic changes to indigenous societies across the Americas. Although no definitive pre-colonization population count exists, it is widely agreed among scholars that between 80% and 90% of the indigenous population was lost within the first few centuries of European colonization. Many scholars lean toward a figure close to 50 million, while others argue the original population could have been as high as 100 million, with some extreme estimates reaching 145 million. The turning point came with Christopher Columbus's 1492 voyage, which set off a wave of European exploration and settlement. This marked the beginning of a massive migration of people from Europe and Africa, leading to the establishment of numerous colonies. European settlers arrived mainly from Spain, Portugal, France, England, and the Netherlands, while the transatlantic slave trade brought a steady flow of Africans. As the settler population grew, indigenous numbers declined precipitously, influenced by a combination of factors, devastating epidemics brought by the newcomers, direct violence, warfare, forced displacement, and widespread disruption of indigenous societies. The arrival of Europeans in the Americas brought not only new customs and technologies, but also a host of diseases that would have devastating consequences for indigenous populations. European society had a long history of close living with domesticated animals, cows, pigs, sheep, goats, horses, dogs, and various fowl. From these animals, many diseases had originally developed, and generations of Europeans had gradually built up antibodies to these illnesses. Indigenous people, by contrast, had no such history with these Eurasian diseases, and therefore lacked any inherited immunity. After 1492, widespread contact with Europeans unleashed a wave of deadly pathogens across the Americas. Smallpox, typhus, influenza, diphtheria, and measles spread like wildfire, killing between 10 million and 100 million people, which could be up to 95% of the indigenous population. The staggering loss of life created a level of cultural and political destabilization that unwittingly aided European colonists in their expansion, particularly in regions like New England and Massachusetts, where indigenous societies had once thrived with rich lands and resources. The catastrophic mortality from these diseases remains difficult to quantify precisely due to the scale and speed of the devastation. As these pathogens made their way through the New World, the spread was initially slow because few Europeans were visibly infected, their immunity protecting them from active symptoms. This changed when Europeans began forcibly transporting large numbers of enslaved people from West and Central Africa. These enslaved Africans, like the indigenous peoples, had no immunity to European diseases. In 1520, an enslaved African carrying smallpox arrived in Yucatan, initiating a wave of infections that spread through South America and into the Plata Basin by 1558. The Taino people of Hispaniola, numbering around 250,000, were among the first indigenous groups to encounter Columbus. They were the predominant culture in the Greater Antilles and the Bahamas but within 30 years, roughly 70% of the Tainos had perished. Lacking immunity, they were particularly vulnerable to diseases like smallpox and measles. One tragic outbreak struck a camp of enslaved Africans, from which smallpox spread to the nearby Taino population, 
reducing their numbers by half. For indigenous communities across the Americas, these diseases were the primary driver of population decline. The introduction of old world diseases resulted in the deaths of 90 to 95% of the indigenous population within 150 years of first contact with Europeans and Africans. Hispaniola was one of the first regions to feel the impact. In 1518, a smallpox epidemic killed between a third and half of the island's indigenous population. The disease claimed the life of the Incan ruler Huayna Capac, sparking the Inca Civil War in 1529-1532, just as the empire faced its first encounters with Spanish conquistadors. Smallpox was only the beginning. Typhus, likely introduced in 1546, influenza and smallpox together in 1558, smallpox again in 1589, diphtheria in 1614, and measles in 1618, each tore through indigenous communities, leaving few survivors. In Mexico, smallpox alone killed millions. When Panfilo de Narvaez arrived in Veracruz in April 1520, he inadvertently brought the virus, which ravaged the region throughout the 1520s. In Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire, smallpox may have killed over 150,000 people, paving the way for Hernán Cortés's conquest of the empire in 1521. The unintentional introduction of disease proved more deadly to the indigenous people of the Americas than any weapon, reshaping the demographic and cultural landscape of an entire hemisphere. The arrival of European diseases like smallpox and measles devastated indigenous communities in North America, claiming between 50 and 67 percent of the population within a century of contact. The effects were rapid and sweeping, with catastrophic losses that transformed the social fabric of indigenous nations. In the region around the Massachusetts Bay Colony, an especially deadly smallpox epidemic between 1617 and 1619 wiped out around 90% of the nearby Native American population, leaving whole communities severely depleted or entirely erased. Similar patterns unfolded in other areas as European settlers moved inland. In 1633, Native Americans near Fort Orange, in what would become New Netherland, encountered smallpox after contact with Europeans, leading to another wave of deadly infections. This outbreak spread westward, reaching as far as Lake Ontario by 1636 and devastating the lands of the Iroquois by 1679. The disease continued to infiltrate indigenous communities for decades, with the West Coast Native American populations losing at least 30% of their numbers to smallpox during the 1770s. The loss of indigenous populations after European contact drove Spanish explorers to push beyond the Caribbean islands they initially settled in the 1490s. With so many indigenous lives lost, the Spanish faced a labor shortage, yet they still required workers to cultivate food and extract gold. While slavery was not foreign to indigenous societies, it took on a different form under European influence. Indigenous enslavement quickly became a commercial enterprise, expanding in ways that reflect the kind of human trafficking recognized today. Though disease proved the primary killer, slavery and forced labor further devastated indigenous communities. As other European powers arrived in the Americas, the scope of indigenous enslavement only grew, as prohibitions on slavery were not established until later. Estimates suggest that from Columbus's arrival through the 19th century, between 2.5 and 5 million indigenous people were enslaved. Men, women, and children were often taken into forced labor on the frontier, in domestic work, and in dangerous conditions within gold and silver mines. The Spanish utilized a labor practice called the encomienda system, which provided Spanish colonists with access to indigenous labor. This system had roots in the Reconquista, where tribute was demanded from Muslims and Jews in Spain. Under the encomienda, the Spanish crown would allocate a number of indigenous workers to a Spanish overseer, often a conquistador or influential Spaniard. In theory, the encomendero was to protect and convert indigenous workers to Christianity. In practice, however, indigenous people endured severe exploitation, required to pay tributes in gold, agricultural produce, and labor. Attempts by the Spanish crown to dismantle the encomienda through measures like the laws of Burgos and the new laws of the Indies met resistance from encomenderos who ignored these reforms, resulting in continued abuse. When the encomienda system eventually gave way, it was replaced by the repartimiento system, which imposed a slightly altered form of forced labor that persisted until the late 18th century. Though both systems theoretically offered some protections, in reality, they contributed heavily to the suffering and exploitation of indigenous populations throughout Spanish colonies.
As gold deposits in the Caribbean rapidly depleted and indigenous populations declined drastically, Spanish colonists faced a significant labor shortage. Desperate for a profitable export, they found their solution in cane sugar, a high-value, low-bulk commodity with a growing demand in Europe. This sweet but labor-intensive crop required vast numbers of workers, and the Spanish solved this by importing enslaved Africans to establish sugar plantations, marking the beginning of a brutal system where chattel slaves were forced to work on these large estates. Sugar plantations operated on a massive scale, requiring plantation owners to make considerable investments in labor, housing, food, and infrastructure. The sugar mills, built on site to process cane immediately after harvesting, were essential, as cut cane quickly lost its sugar content. Plantations and their owners became embedded in an extensive network of creditors and merchants who financed, processed, and sold sugar across Europe. This entire enterprise relied on a vast enslaved population, with the Portuguese dominating the African slave trade due to their control over the African coasts, a domain granted by the Treaty of Tordesillas. In addition to the Portuguese colonies, black slavery became the primary labor force in tropical regions where sugar was grown, including Portuguese Brazil and English, French, and Dutch islands in the Caribbean. In mainland North America, particularly in the southern English colonies, enslaved Africans were introduced as early as 1619 in Virginia, initially to work on crops like tobacco, rice, and eventually cotton, alongside sugar in some areas. Despite the connection between slavery and agricultural work, in Spanish America, enslaved and free blacks, along with mulattoes, often lived in cities, working as artisans and craftsmen. Conversion to Christianity was encouraged for enslaved Africans, though their non-Christian status upon arrival was seen as an opportunity for religious instruction. The Catholic Church did not view slavery as incompatible with Christianity. On the contrary, religious orders such as the Jesuits profited greatly from agricultural enterprises supported by enslaved labor. Some European intellectuals, drawing on ancient theories from Aristotle and Ptolemy, justified slavery through a pseudo-scientific concept of latitude belts. This theory held that the Earth's latitudes influenced human characteristics. People from the cold zone in northern Europe were considered less prudent, while those from the hot zone in sub-Saharan Africa were thought intelligent, yet weaker and less spirited. The Mediterranean temperate zone, in contrast, was seen as balanced, embodying the ideal human qualities. Such beliefs served as ideological reinforcement for a supposed hierarchy of human worth, rationalizing the subjugation of Africans and indigenous peoples alike. The transatlantic slave trade became a highly profitable enterprise, enriching those involved in capturing, transporting, and trading African slaves. African captives were often taken by coastal tribes in Africa, who sold them to Europeans in exchange for goods such as rum, guns, and other manufactured items. Over the course of this harrowing trade, an estimated 12 million Africans were forcibly transported to the Caribbean, Brazil, and other colonies in the Portuguese, Spanish, French, Dutch, and British empires. The sugar plantations in the Caribbean and Brazil consumed the vast majority of these enslaved individuals, where the grueling conditions drastically reduced life expectancy, necessitating a constant influx of new enslaved people to sustain production. In contrast, about 600,000 enslaved Africans were brought to what would become the United States, accounting for roughly 5% of the total transatlantic slave trade. Nonetheless, the implications of slavery were profound, seeding economic, social, and cultural patterns that would impact both sides of the Atlantic for centuries. Throughout history, the forced removal of indigenous people from their ancestral lands has been a recurring and tragic reality, often enforced under the guise of political treaties and promises that were rarely kept. One of the most infamous examples of this was the Trail of Tears in the 1830s a series of forced relocations targeting several indigenous tribes from the southeastern United States. Under policies sanctioned by the U.S. government, an estimated 100,000 people from the so-called Five Civilized Tribes, the Cherokee, Creek, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Seminole, were driven from their lands and sent on perilous journeys westward. This brutal policy, enshrined in the Treaty of New Dakota, was ostensibly a fair exchange promising the Cherokee $5 million in return for vacating their land to settle west of the Mississippi River. But for those who endured the forced migrations, the experience was anything but fair or humane. The implications of this forced removal were dire. 
Historian Jeffrey Osler estimates that between 12,000 and 17,000 indigenous people died as a result of the removals from 1830 through the 1850s. Conditions during these migrations were horrific, marked by starvation, exposure, and disease. Those who survived faced further hardships in unfamiliar territories where even the basics of survival, food, shelter, and clean water, were severely lacking. For many, the journey west symbolized a heartbreaking severance from the lands that held cultural and spiritual significance to them, resulting in a profound loss not only of life but also of identity and heritage. While the forced relocation of the five civilized tribes is perhaps the most well-known instance, it was not the only one. Across the northern United States, indigenous groups faced similar fates in what has been called the Trails of Tears for Northern Tribes. Federal and state authorities, often supported by private interests like farmers and land speculators, orchestrated the removal of tribes such as the Shawnee, Delaware, Seneca, Potawatomi, Miami, Wyandotte, Ho-Chunk, Ojibwe, Sauk, and Meskwaki. These tribes were displaced and relocated west of the Mississippi River into what is now eastern Kansas. They arrived in this unfamiliar land as displaced people, numbering about 17,000 upon their initial settlement. However, the northern tribes did not find the relief and stability they might have hoped for in these new lands. By 1860, their population had been halved due to an onslaught of factors ranging from polluted water supplies and rampant disease to social stresses that compounded their vulnerability. Living conditions were harsh and resources were scarce. Polluted drinking water, inadequate shelter, and limited food resources fostered a devastating cycle of low fertility and high infant mortality. Moreover, these relocations were not merely displacements, they were a systematic disruption of their societies and ways of life, leading to enduring trauma that reverberated through the generations. The forced relocation of these northern tribes was even more complicated by the fact that the lands to which they were relocated were already inhabited by other indigenous nations. The Osage, Kansa, Omaha, Iowa, Oto, and Missouri tribes had already established themselves in these western regions, thriving off their lands with economies, cultures, and social structures intact. In a misguided attempt to make space for the thousands of displaced people from the east, the U.S. government forcibly dispossessed western tribes of significant portions of their lands, setting the stage for a volatile mix of strained resources and disrupted communities. According to scientists from University College London, the colonization of the Americas by Europeans killed so much of the indigenous population that it resulted in climate change and global cooling. In addition to the environmental impact, colonial policies in the Americas also led to direct and systematic violence against indigenous populations. Sources such as the Cambridge World History, the Oxford Handbook of Genocide Studies, and the Cambridge World History of Genocide document that colonial tactics sometimes amounted to deliberate genocide in certain regions of North America. Accounts from the Cambridge World History of Genocide detail how, during the Spanish colonization of the Americas, some actions went beyond warfare, including targeted massacres with the intent to destroy indigenous communities. These events left a permanent mark on the indigenous populations of the Americas and are remembered as some of the darkest moments in the continent's history of European colonization.